what I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, uh, interpolation forgery in fake news in late antiquity. Um, let's begin with this guy here. Um, a. E. Hausmann became famous for, for failing his Oxford Classics finals as an undergraduate at St. John's and incidentally for being the greatest British Latinist of the past century. In, uh, in 1903, uh, Hausmann had been professor of Latin at UCL for over a decade, and that is when he published the first volume of his monumental edition of the first century AD Latin astronomical poet, Manilius. Hausmann was a savage polemicist. In the preface to Manilius, he chastised previous editors of the text for dishonesty and incompetence, and in doing so made the immortal remark that the love of truth is the faintest of all the human passions. Hausmann's maxim about truth might be used as a negative way of defining interpolation, which literary scholars still tend to perceive as inherently crooked and fake. But what is interpolation? Interpolation is the insertion of non-authorial matter into the text of an author. Is interpolation always fake? Absolutely, insofar as it is not, it was not written by the author of the surrounding text, but it is not always deliberate. No, not always. For example, annotations in the margins of manuscripts may be mistakenly copied into a text. If that happens sufficiently early in the transmission of a text, all the copies surviving at a later stage may no longer distinguish between the original text and the later edition. So it all becomes the same in a way. Interpolation is not a prerogative of ancient texts. We could discuss today interpolation in medieval, modern, and even somehow contemporary literatures. That said, the timelessness and uh, universality of interpolation are unsurprising. People have always distorted and manipulated each other's words. Always, quite literally, as in the thought-provoking example provided by Rufinus of Aquileia, a fourth century church father to whom we will soon return. According to Rufinus, the earliest documented case of interpolation is found in Genesis, the first book of the Old Testament. God says to Adam that he is free to eat all the fruit in the Garden of Eden apart from the fruit of knowledge, and later Satan, in the form of a snake, by manipulating, by, by interpolating God's words, induces Eve to eat precisely that fruit. That said, even if we know that interpolation is timeless and universal, our tendency is to assume that it only took place in the past, that it only affected the works of dead authors whose words, whose voices, are buried under decades of centuries of transmission. Now, just to keep it more real, think about this. How would you react today if you were to discover that the last book you wrote has been interpolated or that books you never wrote are circulating under your name? OK, enough about theory. Tonight, I will consider the experience of three church fathers whose works were forged or interpolated during their lifetime. Let's begin with Gregory the Great, a late 6th century pope, or as they might have said at the time, Bishop of Rome. Gregory is famous for coordinating the first crucial steps of the conversion of the Anglo-Saxons in England. He was also a very prolific writer. Many of his dialogues and sermons have survived along with a vast collection of letters. And it is in a letter to his friend Eusebius, Bishop of Thessalonica, that Gregory attacks Andrew, a treacherous Greek monk, in his entourage. Andrew is accused by Gregory of forging a public letter of Eusebius and substituting it for the original that Eusebius had entrusted him to deliver to Gregory's community. But there is more. Andrew also forged three of Gregory's sermons and other forgeries may have gone unnoticed. Unfortunately, in his letter, Gregory omits a very important detail he does not say whether he deduced Andrew's motives based on the heretical content of the forgeries or whether Andrew was questioned and confessed that he had intended to discredit Eusebius and Gregory by preaching heretical doctrines under their names. 
Now, let's briefly focus on uh, Gregory's refutation of the forgeries and handling of the scandal. Gregory knows that Andrew's letter could not have been written by Eusebius, simply enough because his friend is not a heretic. The reasoning is completely tautologous, but in this case, strong arguments are not needed since Andrew's forgery is based on, authentic letter, on an authentic letter by Eusebius, which Gregory could presumably obtain and circulate if needed. And in this case, it's obviously needed, right? On the contrary, the forged sermons are not based on authentic material. Gregory's refutation is altogether different. He could not have written the sermons, he says, because the sermons are in Greek, a language that he cannot even read. This argument is either very strong or very weak, depending on whether we trust Gregory's alleged ignorance. We should say that Gregory was an authoritative bishop and theologian. He could easily convince other people that the sermons had been forged by the insignificant monk Andrew. The difference in their relative ranks and power makes this, this struggle for attribution uneven from the start. Gregory settled letter as a public accusation of Andrew. The letter conveys instructions to Eusebius and implicitly to anyone else who might come across sermons. These sermons are dangerous. They must be stopped from circulating more widely. They must be destroyed. Once this information has been accepted, it becomes harder to put it right, even if, or especially if, you will tell me about that, even if, or especially if, you are the Pope. Our next case also involves a forged letter, but Jerome's opponent, so we have Jerome on the left of the slide and the opponent on the right. Jerome's opponent, I was saying, the putative author of the letter, was not an imposter monk. The fact is that Jerome was challenging Rufinus, who no less than he was a popular preacher and acclaimed translator of Christian theology into Latin. The authority of Jerome's archenemy was therefore beyond question. It is not possible to discuss Jerome's refutation of this letter without sketching the underlying theological dispute, the so-called originist controversy, a fierce polemic that took place between the 4th and 5th century. This controversy takes its name from Origen, a 3rd century Greek church father from Alexandria in Egypt. Origen's revolutionary theology found opponents as soon as it started circulating. Many could not accept Origen's view about the Trinity and about the resurrection of the dead. Origen was centuries ahead of his time, a, a, a proto Protestant, so to speak. This tension reached the point of no return when 4th and 5th century anti-Trinitarian heretics appropriated Origen's doctrines, which were declared heretical in the 6th century. As you see in the slide, the year is AD 553 at the Council of Constantinople. The posthumous excommunication of Origen had very serious long-term effects. Of the over 6,000 volumes that Origen was said to have written, only a tiny fraction has survived, and most of these surviving volumes have reached us only in Rufinus' Latin translation. So thank you very much, Rufinus, otherwise we wouldn't be able to read Origen at all, almost at all. But. In the Originist controversy, Jerome and the Bishop of Salamis Salamis in Cyprus, not Salamis in Greece. So Jerome and the Bishop of Salamis accused Origen's writings of being heretical, whereas Rufinus and the Bishop of Jerusalem, Joan, defended their, their, their orthodoxy. Rufinus wrote a two-book accusation of Jerome, to which Jerome responded with a three-book accusation of Rufinus, the apology against Jerome by Rufinus and the apology against Rufinus by Jerome. In fact, as you can see at the bottom of this slide, Jerome was so eager to to counterattack, that he wrote the first two books of his apology even before reading the two books of the apology against Jerome that Rufinus had written. So, a shot in the dark, quite literally. Right. Um, the passage about the forged letter, finally, is found in book two of Against Rufinus. Jerome says that his friend Eusebius of Cremona wrote to him from Africa in order to inform him that he had come across a strange letter circulating under his name. In this letter, Jerome acknowledged that his famous translation of the Bible, his life work, was an overall failure. Meanwhile, Jerome's friends in Rome have written to him in bewilderment 
because the same letter is circulating there too. Here, we must notice an important difference between Gregory and Jerome. In both cases, misinformation has spread from the east to the west. Gregory, however, is confident that the damage will be minimal, whereas Jerome's words convey a feeling of helplessness and discomfort. I keep silence, Jerome says, but a letter that is not mine speaks against me. Jerome's twofold refutation reminds us of Gregory's refutation of the sermons. First, Jerome maintains that the style of the letter is incompatible with his own. Now, we should bear in mind that according to Jerome, the forger of the letter is Rufinus. This reminds us in turn of two chapters of Book One of Against Rufinus, in which Jerome pours scorn over Rufinus's pedestrian Latin style. And you can see a sample of those chapters in the middle of this slide. Second point of Jerome's refutation, he highlights an important logical incongruity. Rufinus simultaneously mocks Jerome for acknowledging the poor quality of his translation of the Bible in the letter and attacks him for boasting that his translation of the Old Testament is superior to the Septuagint. Now, I should have explained that in the slide. In fact, the Septuagint is the most authoritative Greek translation of the Old Testament that was made in the third century BC. It was the most authoritative then, it still is. And so, yeah, an important model for any other later translator, such as Jer Jerome was. But back to Jerome's argument, how can, how can Jerome be both ashamed and proud of his Bible at the same time? He can't, and therefore uh, Rufinus must be the one who's lying. One last point about Jerome's reputation. Rufinus did not specify when or where Jerome boasted of his superiority to the Septuagint. This is one of the many passages of Against Rufinus in which Jerome condemns his rival for not providing references to published works in support of his allegations. In turn, Jerome refutes Rufinus's accusation of boasting by citing multiple instances of deference to the Septuagint in the prefaces to his translation. So some sort of fact checking is going on here. Um, right. Our last case is an open letter of origin himself to his friends in Alexandria. We can read this letter thanks to Rufinus, who very kindly translated it into Latin in a short treatise on the falsification of the works of origin. In this treatise, Rufinus postulates that throughout the fourth century, heretics added many interpolations to the works of origin. Accordingly, Jerome and the ones who condemned Origen's views are actually condemning spurious views that have nothing to do with Origen. You can just see from what I've just said that the argument is quite convenient. Whether that's well founded or not, well, we'll see about that. In Origen's letter, there is a case of forgery and then another of interpolation. The first case takes place after a disputation between Origen and a heretic. The heretic stole the transcript of the disputation, made additions and cuts, and circulated it in order to harm Origen's reputation. The second case also involves a disputation, the one that never happened. Another heretic met Origen in Antioch, in Syria. He did not dare to speak in Origen's presence, but after some time he falsified the transcript of a disputation between himself and Origen, in which Origen voiced laughable views. Now let's get to the more interesting part, Origen's reaction, which could not be more pragmatic. Origen directly confronted both the interpolator and the forger. First of all, he discovered an original draft of the interpolated disputation among his unpublished papers and published it in the hope that his readers would be able to tell the difference. What happened next is totally unexpected. Origen actually got a chance to meet the interpolator and ask him, what we all fantasize about asking the putative interpolators of these or that text. Why on earth did you do it? The interpolator's answer, however, is very logical. Because they wanted to adorn and purify the discussion, he says. But it was he who circulated the interpolated disputation in order to discredit origin. Was the interpolator deliberately telling a lie then? If so, origin does not seem to get the irony. The dynamics of the second case are very similar. So briefly, 
uh, in the event, Origin went to Antioch and in order to counteract the impact of the forged disputation, publicly confronted the forger who ended up, Origin says, and Rufinus translates, convicted by everyone and silenced. The time has come to outline a conclusion and attempt a comparison between contemporary fakes in antiquity and fake news today. In all the cases that we have discussed from origin to Gregory, allegations of textual manipulations were used to establish, strengthen, weaken, or demolish authority. Whose authority? Both that of the alleged victims and that of the alleged perpetrators of forgery and interpolation. In theory, they pursued truth. In practice, however, they tried to assert their own authority by sticking the label of fake onto their opponents. Instead of legitimizing their own paradigm of orthodoxy, they strove to delegitimize their opponents' allegedly heretical views. This is how, among the church fathers, fake became and remained for centuries a defining category of theological debate. And, we've, and, we, and if we follow this trail, the trail of fake, the fathers' laborious struggle for salvation revealed themselves to be mudslinging and politicking for the sake of dominance. For a simple reason, ideology and personal interest do not allow an honest pursuit of truth. I think that we cannot define truth objectively. A definition of truth may be either completely abstract or completely obvious, or else inherently relative. In fact, we could say that the easiest way of defining truth is by pointing out what truth is not, that is to say, fake. In other words, if you get to define fake first, you will get to define truth and monopolize authority as a consequence. But if our definition of truth depends on authority and ideology, it becomes detached from its natural purity. Truth for truth's sake, we might say. The dynamics of fake news today are the very same, I think, but the media are more sophisticated. We have Facebook and Twitter instead of manuscripts, forums and websites instead of public gatherings, and mainstream media too, such as the television and the press. In recent years, we have witnessed the popularization of truth making. The greater your authority, whoever you are, the greater the impact of your truth, whatever that might be. This fragmentation of truth, regardless of the nature and quality of individual truths, is an advantage for those whose authority is greater than anyone else's. With the erasure of objective truth, the most authoritative personal truth dominates and, makes, and might also erase obvious facts in the process. After all, everybody needs a truth, and if there are no logical grounds for deciding which one is the best, we're led to pick the loudest, or the one that we hear repeated more often, or maybe even both. Ideology may not have an objective foundation, but it does have a purpose. The Church Fathers' reconfiguration of truth had a double aim, both to establish Christianity against Judaism and paganism, and to impose Catholic orthodoxy on a growing network of heresies. The Christians were taking the lead in history, more authority needed to be capitalized, and truth to be redesigned accordingly. So what about us? Is it a coincidence that the notion of fake news and false truth came into being during the 2016 American presidential campaign? Would it be inappropriate to draw a link then between Christianity, the great imperial religion, and America, the great Western empire, the great Western democracy, as we've recently, very recently seen? But we also have to admit that there is fabrication of truth in Russia, for example, which is not exactly a democracy, and even in atheist China, in which even the element of religion is removed from the equation. Well, we might as well turn back to our individual biases now. 2020 is drawing to a close, and we're still far from Rufinus's ideal audience as he introduces it to us in, um, uh, on the falsification of the works of origin by saying, those who listen to what is said not out of a pursuit of strife, but out of a love of truth. But I should remind you that a love of truth is, according to Hausmann, the faintest of all the human passions. Thank you very much for listening.